Click, click. Whee! <laughs> click, click, boom. Hi, everyone. I'm not Razor Kane. This is the Weekly Space Hangout. <laughs> <laughs> I am your, your fill-in host this week, Nicole Bellucci. I will be uh, hosting this ragtag band of awesome astronomy people as we talk about uh, this week's space news. We have all kinds of planetary space news. Uh, as well as some interesting political uh, stuff, which we will go ahead and get started with. Scott, you had some um, some news on NASA and Russia and what's going to happen. Are they BFFs? They are not BFFs, come to find out. Um, and actually, with the scientists that I've spoken with, uh, well, let, let's wind back. Let's let's roll this back. So there was a leaked memo. Um, uh, leaked internal memo say, stating that NASA will no longer be working with the Russian Federation. Um, with the exception of the International Space Station and maintaining the safety of the astronauts in orbit, and that blew up. Uh, I originally saw it on The Verge. I was actually in the lab at the time, and so I'm like tweeting my fingers off going, tell me more. Um, and then there was you know, rumors that there's going to be an official statement released by NASA later that night, which there was. The verbiage on it, I was not happy with, and many of uh, my fellow space nerds were not. I'm actually pulling it up right now so I can read it verbatim, just because it the it's the only way to really convey the whiskey tango foxtrot of all this. <laughs> um, as is, given Russia's ongoing violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, NASA is suspending the majority of its ongoing engagements with the Russian Federation. NASA and Roscosmos will, however, continue to work together to maintain safe and continuous operation of the International Space Station. NASA is laser-focused on a plan to return human spaceflight launches to American soil and end our reliance on Russia to get into space. This has been a top priority of the Obama administrations for the past five years, and had our plan been fully funded, we would have returned American hu human spaceflight launches um. and the jobs they support back to the United States next year. With the reduced level of funding approved by Congress, we are now looking at launching from U.S. soil in 2017. The choice here is between fully funding the plan to bring space launches back to America or continuing to send millions of dollars to the Russians. It's that simple. The Obama administration chooses to invest in America, and we are hopeful that Congress will do the same. That is the most highly politicized NASA statement I have ever heard in my entire life. Um, it is I just my my brain exploded when I got home to read that, wow. and it's really taking away the big importance of what's going on here, which is science, and it's something that throughout all of you know, the history going on, even with the ups and downs between the United States and Russia, there's always maintained that cooperation on scientific endeavors, especially when it comes to things like the ISS. The ISS is still going to be working with our astronauts, with the cosmonauts. Um, I'd be a little worried, especially since if I was the astronaut that just arrived at the ISS last week, um, on how I'm going to get how I'm going to get home and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's kind of a surprise since the administrator of NASA like three, four weeks ago just publicly said things are fine with, with the cooperation between NASA and Roscosmos. There's not going to be any issues going on. And then a month later this happens. So, yeah, the, a lot of the scientists I've spoke with are very upset about the uh, the politicizing of scientific endeavors between our space agencies, and are a little worried about what's going to happen in the past or in the future, not only with this but also, you know, what's going to happen when we want to send up more astronauts? Do we wait till 2017? Is there a secret TARDIS that we don't know about that's going to be bringing people up and down? And we're having enough trouble maintaining funding to continue programs. And this is, you know, going into, okay, you're going to somehow fund a brand new program out of what? So it, it's, it makes me very upset. I know a lot of people have been upset, but I've also seen a lot of um, amazing stories come out of American scientists reaching out to Russian scientists with this uh, banner of solidarity, like, you know what? You know, forget what these borders are between us and the leaders that might be going on fighting with one another. 
we still want to work together for these scientific endeavors, and um, we'll just have to see what comes of it. So I was really happy to see the scientists saying, screw this, while really restricted on what they can officially do with their work. So we have a comment from Michael Jobin says, Scott, that is more twisted than a mall soft pretzel. Yes. <laughs> I think that is the best description I've seen. Yeah, it, yeah cause, uh, from what you read, um, I don't know if you can share a link to that. I can, I can share yeah. that in the comments. Um, we, uh, it's more than just a Ukraine situation. There's a whole big, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot to that statement that you right. read. Uh, so I'll share that out. Um, and, and it's not to trivialize what's going on in Crimea, because it's terrible. Um, yeah. for, for those not knowing what's going on, um, the peninsula of Crimea, it's a part of the Ukraine, uh, last month, Not anymore. <laughs> Russia um, went and annexed it. Uh, and there's history to that, where it was originally part of uh, the Russian area back with the USSR back in the, the 19th century. It was gifted to the Ukraine because that's where the leader at the time was from, and the, the history of um, the Crimeans are mainly supportive of the Russian Federation anyway, at least in a political Way. Plus, there's big uh, warships of Russia on Crimea right. as well. I would suggest you tune into your local NPR station. Yeah. On this. <laughs> there's there's so much going much on. And honestly, yeah. just search NASA, Russia, Crimea, and your Google thing will just fill up with all sorts of information of on this, but also on the history of what's going on that's leading up to it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. I wanted to uh, get you in there with that because I know yes. you have to run and do some more video editing. Yay. Um, <laughs> and I know Morgan and uh, had some thoughts on that as well in terms of launch capability. And Nancy, uh, we were just talking before about, because uh, my question was, um, what else do we do with Russia other than the ISS? Because, you know, the ISS is exempt from this. What else is being affected by this? Well, and, and just before I go, um, this video will be up later today, which is talking about this topic, and then tonight okay. at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, uh, Tony and I will be doing a, a longer discussion on this video for Space Fan News Live, so I'll Good. add links to the doobly-doo um, when excellent. I'm done. So thank you guys, and I will see you all later tonight. See you later, Scott. Bye, Scott. Uh, Nancy, did you have some on the, the other things we're doing with Russia that it are being impacted? Uh, yeah, uh, some of the planning for future missions are being affected because uh, um, uh, U.S. scientists are working with the ExoMars mission, which is now a, an ESA and Roscosmos mission, and uh, the Venera D mission, which is a, a proposed mission going to Venus, uh, that is a, a Roscosmos mission, and so any of the U.S. scientists that are working on that or helping to plan that um, you know, they're just, they're not able to do that right now. And then also, um, you know, Russian scientists work on a lot of the planetary missions, and so, uh, you know, I think they're just, uh, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think that they're being kind of cut off from that right now. Mm, yeah. I don't know, Morgan, if you know a little bit more about that or not. Yeah, I don't know uh, anything about particular missions uh, and the Russian involvement, but, you know, Russia's part of the global uh, astronomy community, and, you know, work on a lot of the same things that the rest of us do, and certainly that access is going to be more difficult now than, than it has been before. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning because I wanted to jump right into the stories. I got too excited. Um, if you want to send us a question or a comment, use the Q&A app. Uh, it's embedded in the video, either if you're on Google Plus or YouTube or wherever you're watching it, you should be able to get to the Q&A app. That's what we'll be watching most closely for questions and comments. Uh, and we have a question from Craig Landon. Uh, any coincidence that there, a lot of the astros headed to the ISS are from ESA at the moment? Sounds like it might be a coincidence. I don't know, because these things are planned well in advance, as I understand. Right, exactly. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, the ratio of astronauts from various countries is part of you know international treaties and things like that. Okay. So it's not like that can be switched back and forth at a whim. Sure, sure. Okay. And and Amber, <laughs> I have to put up this this question that we can't answer. Call <laughs> by Amber. Why can't we all just get along? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I can say I sympathize, but we can't answer that, unfortunately. We're at the space I out, now solving all the world's problems. So, uh, Anyone else uh, have any thoughts on that before we move on to a new story? Well, Because okay. you said you had Go some... Ahead, yeah. 
I, I almost wonder, and this is just me kind of speculating. Yeah, I just joined in. I didn't shave, though. So I, I, almost, I almost kind of wonder, and this is just me idly speculating, if this is a, a political move by NASA to try to get more funding toward Orion and SpaceX and try to get more, you know, maybe, maybe they're trying to, to, to play their cards in what they see as maybe an advantageous situation, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of, of uh, <laughs> possibly political moves, uh, we have a story from Morgan about the uh, Europa mission call for ideas. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as much as we'd like to think that NASA stays out of the political game, uh, it's definitely not the case. Uh, and that's by necessity as much as anything else. Uh, and that's certainly the case with Europa. So for those of you who don't know, Europa is one of the four largest moons of Jupiter. Uh, it's one of the largest moons in the solar system, and it's one of the most exciting places uh, to look forward to going to in the solar system because we think that it might have a liquid water ocean uh, underneath its surface, and that was identified by Galileo, the Galileo mission, in the 1990s. But because of the way the Jupiter system is set up, actually getting to Europa is a rel rel relatively challenging thing to do. And it's something that we in the planetary science community have been talking about doing now for a long time. And NASA has finally come out with a request for ideas basically about missions that they could send to Europa. The problem is is that they're really lowballing us on the amount of money that can be spent. Uh, just to kind of put this into perspective, there's three classes of solar system missions. There's the Discovery class mission, and this is things like Messenger, or Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MAVEN, small targeted missions designed to form or to perform basically one task. And those have a budget up into kind of in the 600 millions range. There's then the New Frontiers mission class, which stretches up to about a billion dollars, and that would be like New Horizons, for example, or Spirit and Opportunity would have fit into that class had it been around back in the 2000s. And then there's the big flagship missions, and these cost many billions of dollars. And this is like Curiosity, Cassini, uh, what's left over of Voyager. Uh, and it pretty much, you have to go big to go to the outer solar system because it takes a long time to get there. It takes five years to get there. You want to do something once you're there for a while to make it worthwhile. Uh, and you have to support a lot of people for a long time to make that work. What NASA is asking them to do is to fit within this New Frontiers budget class for about a billion dollars. And that's contrary to, to just about everything that's been proposed or suggested up until now. Uh, the decadal survey, or the every 10-year survey of astronomers and planetary scientists recommended a mission to Europa as one of the highest priorities. But the mission that they've endorsed is more in the two to two and a half billion dollar range. And that's already been cut down from the original proposed mission, uh, which was a flagship mission, and that was in the four to four and a half billion dollar range. And so we started off with that, saying this is what we need to really do Europa right. But for political and financial reasons, that's not going to happen. And so they've been cutting and cutting and cutting to get down to this sort of targeted $2 billion proposal. And now they find out that what NASA is looking for is half that. And that's just a, a massive cut to the capabilities of your mission. And that's a tough thing to stomach because you only get to do these sorts of things kind of once in a generation. We haven't really been to Jupiter since the 90s. Uh, before Cassini at Saturn, it was 20-plus years uh, that we'd been there again. So if we go to Europa, it's the only chance a lot of scientists are going to get in their lifetimes to, to work on this sort of thing. And so they naturally want to do it right and want to do it in a way that has a big enough return on our investment. Um, and so I've seen some speculation that NASA is purposefully lowballing this because they're under orders basically from higher up in the federal government. Uh, and they're hoping to stir up uh, some outcry from scientists saying this isn't enough so that they can go back to Congress and the Office of Management and Budget and people like that and say, look, they're not willing to do it for this. If, you, you know, if the American people want to go to Europa and search for life and search for water, we need to spend more money than this. And 
that's kind of the way people are hoping it's going to play out right now because a billion dollar mission to Europa is a very, uh, very sketchy uh, proposition. Is it is it even worth um, going? Will they be able to answer enough of a science question to, to make it worth that money? It's tough to say uh, because there's a lot of open questions on Europa. Um, because of or, yeah, because of the way the Galileo mission played out in the 90s, we weren't able to collect nearly as much data uh, about anything in the Jupiter system as we would have liked. If, for those of you who might not remember, uh, when Galileo got to Jupiter, its main antenna didn't, exp didn't open up. Mm -hmm. And so they could only send back a tiny fraction of the originally planned information. And so we have some pictures and some measurements of the surface, but we really have a huge number of open questions. And trying to answer only a few of those isn't going to really clear the picture up and lead to a definitive statement. Yes, there's water under the surface of Europa. Yes, that water is reaching the surface. Yes, there's organic compounds in that, uh, in that liquid. And these are all questions that you know, are the highest priority questions to be answered in planetary science. Are there plumes on Europa now? We saw that maybe with the Hubble Space Telescope at the end of last year. And answering one or two of these questions is interesting, but it doesn't give us a big picture about Europa and about Europa's interaction with the rest of the Jupiter system. And, um, and when, when Juno arrives there next year, it's not, or uh, in 2016, it's not even going anywhere near those moons. So. No, and it's not designed to make those sorts of measurements. It doesn't really have cameras on it. It's, it's all about magnetic fields. With those the, solar panels, yeah, it can't go anywhere near uh, the, in the inner radiation belts of Jupiter at all. It would fry those solar panels, so... Yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of uh, the uh, last year, they shut down the production of the RTGs too, which they would need plutonium to steady uh, Europa. They started up plutonium production, but the newer generation of RTGs aren't being uh, researched anymore. So right, yeah. So they just important. canned earlier this year the uh, advanced Sterling radioisotopic yeah, generator, they, which was supposed to be this next generation power source that would allow missions to be a lot cheaper and. Yeah, those were like bigger. four, uh -huh. I believe they were four times more efficient, so they yeah. would have to do it with the old, and the, the plutonium pipeline is going to take a few years to get a fair amount. We've got a little bit that's classified how much they think they have enough maybe for one Curiosity-style mission right now, which uh, I think 2020 there's going to be Curiosity 2 is heading to Mars, whatever, they're going to, the, the next generation rover, so that's going to be an issue too. That's definitely going to bottleneck a lot of these outer solar system missions if uh, we can't get plutonium on the launch pad, so... Yeah, we're talking about question. arrival at mid 2020s, you know, yeah. maybe early 2030s. Um, I'm getting old. They need to hurry up. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, that's how a lot of scientists feel about this, uh, but they also don't want to send a half-assed mission, basically. So we have a question from Paul Gracie. Uh, does that one billion include the entire budget, or is this meant to be in combination with ESA or some other funding source for a bigger mission? So the one billion dollars includes, I believe, the entire budget. But these things are usually quoted without the cost of the rocket. Mm -hmm. uh, which tends to be on the order of uh, $250 million because the prices of those fluctuate back and forth a lot. Uh, but my understanding is that NASA is envisioning this as a bulk uh, program from NASA. Yeah, uh, that's, because, that's the way the email seemed to be because I got that email as well. NASA has their own idea for this sort of mission called JUICE, JUICE! for the <laughs> Jupiter Icy Satellite <laughs> Explorer. Yeah. Uh, and it's a similar kind of mission, and it's looking at a similar sort of timeline, mm -hmm. but it, it wouldn't be focused just on, in, or on, on Europa, and, and so it wouldn't be nearly as in-depth as what I think most people well, It's, it's going to focus on Ganymede, right, right. which is uh, an interesting location because it's got its own magnetic field, and so you have some protection quite a bit more protection from the radiation environment around Jupiter. Personally, I'm a fan of Ganymede, so I like yeah, well, it. Ganymede's <laughs> further out than Europa, and it's more massive, it's so it's possible field. to actually enter orbit about Ganymede. Right. Uh, that's not yeah. really feasible in Europa, and even these really big missions, they're only planning to fly by like uh, 40 or 50 times over the course of a year or two right, right. Uh, because of how complicated the Jupiter system is. So speaking of subsurface o subsurface oceans, surprise or not, <laughs> Enceladus is an ocean underneath. Yeah, Did pretty exciting. That? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Ever since 2005, when Cassini first saw the uh, the geyser spewing from the fractures in Enceladus's south pole, you know, scientists have been really hypothesizing that 
you know, what's fueling this? Well, probably a huge underground <laughs> reservoir of water. Um, and this week the news was that uh, the scientists did confirm that in fact there is a large subsurface ocean there. So how they did this was kind of MacGyverish. Uh, they used changes in the radio signals that were beamed back to Earth you know, just the regular uh, uh, communication signals just, just to see how the gravity from the various parts of Enceladus kind of altered the, the spacecraft's flight path. Um, and they used data from uh, three different flybys, uh, one in 2010 and, and uh, two in uh, 2012. And they were probably, uh, all three of those flybys that were about a, um, 100 kilometers from Enceladus. And uh, so these measurements then of how the spacecraft's uh, orbit was changed could be used to def um, to infer the, the distribution of the mass inside the moon. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that, that there was a lower than average reading at the South Pole, and so that in turn implies a, a mass deficit there. And uh, they said the best explanation for this is an ice shell that overlays a liquid water um, ocean, at, and they think it's at a depth of about uh, 30 to 40 um, kilometers and uh, it's just interesting that the you know during these flybys the the gravitational tug of the that altered the spacecraft's flight uh, it changed its velocity by just point uh, point two to uh, point three millimeters per second um, and so it, I mean it's very tiny variations but they said that the only way to get more precise measurements would be to put seismometers on mm -hmm. Enceladus's surface and, and of course we know that's not going to happen anytime soon so uh, it, it was a, a, a good news or, or a fun um, you know fun piece of news to get that they actually did kind of confirm this. Confirmed. Ocean confirmed. There's oceans. Yeah, I got a picture. There's oceans everywhere. Yeah, I've been screen sharing that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like you were saying. I think we pretty much were pretty certain there was an ocean there. Yeah. Well, we saw yeah. water pouring out, so it was coming yeah. from somewhere. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Good to know. Um, we have a question about this from Bert Walters. Uh, do you think life in an ocean on Enceladus has a better chance than on Europa because Saturn's weaker radiation field? No. Anyone want to speculate? Mm -hmm. No. That's no, not because yeah. of that, but because um, of the temperature uh, situation. You know, it's unlikely that, we, we think it's probably unlikely that Enceladus has been active like this all the time. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, there's too much heat now to be explained by any uh, long-term phenomena. And so we think this is probably a periodic thing. And periodicity is not the friend of life. Uh, yeah. At Europa, on the other hand, uh, it's in this very steady, very uh, repeating uh, resonance with the other moons that's generating heat for it. And that's likely to have been a much longer term situation. Uh, in addition, the temperatures at Jupiter are 25 to 50 degrees warmer than uh, they are at Saturn anyhow. And within the ocean, you know, 10 to 20 kilometers under the surface, you'd be reasonably protected from the magnetic field. Uh, I would say. It's definitely going to be chemotropic, not phototropic there, though, at least for, for the energy source, anyway. At which I, one? At, at Europa? At, e at either one, really. Either one, okay. Yeah, but, you know, I, I almost kind of wonder, Plu when we look at Pluto next July, it has a large moon next to it, flexing it, too, although they're tidally locked. I, I, I talked with a scientist before, he said, you know, it's not out of the question, there might be some core heating going on there, too. So okay. it might be, that would be kind of interesting to see. There's a, one more attractive thing about Europa, which is Io. Uh, and Io is nearby, blasting off volcanoes of material. and uh, Some of this material falls onto Europa. And if there is a connection between the surface and the subsurface ocean, uh, like we think some of the cracks on the surface might be, then this would allow organic-type material to filter down into the ocean and provide a chemical food source for something that might be living there. Yummy. Yummy! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for Ganymede, but that's just me. Um, I'm not a blind Uh Nancy, I want to hear all about this skydiver. Yeah. That may or may not have almost been hit by a meteor. Yeah, it's it's a pretty interesting story. Um, uh, um, a lot of people are not convinced, but uh, anyway, what happened about uh, about two years ago? Uh, a guy named Anders Hellstrup was skydiving in in Norway. And, you know, at, at the time he thought it was just a routine jump or whatever, but he had two um, cameras attached to his helmet and he was, um, you know, so he took footage of his, of his dive. 
And uh, when he was reviewing the footage later, he you know quickly saw he saw something zooming past him, uh, you know really quickly. So he slowed it down, and it was a rock. And uh, uh, you know he didn't know what to think about it. Uh, so he took it to some experts, and uh, they think that it um, that he captured a meteorite falling uh, during what's called its dark flight, when it's you know it's it's not you know streaking through the atmosphere. It's it's gone through the atmosphere enough that it's slowed down. It's it's cooled. It's it's not glowing or or heating or anything. So um, this this rock is you know definitely in the video. Um, and a lot of people have asked me, um, you know, do I think it's real? Well, personally, I don't think it's, um, you know, it's. I don't think it's a hoax at all that these, uh, that they doctored the footage or, you know, somebody threw the rock or, or whatever. You so know, because he was, is he, real. he this was, yeah, the footage rock, is. It's not. The footage is real. Okay. Whether I haven't had a chance to see it yet. Yeah, whether whether or not it's uh you know a meteor or you know soon to be a meteorite, uh, or not is I think is certainly up for debate. I know that there's a lot of meteorite experts that that are that think that there's no way possible that this is a a, a meteor meteorite. He was, uh, he was but I talked using to one of these little SkyPro cameras. Probably, yeah, 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 yeah. But I talked to a very respected astrophysicist. His name is Paul Brecke from Norway, and he was actually part of the investigation. And they've they've kind of sat on this for almost two years because uh, one, they want, really wanted to confirm that this was a meteor, uh, that you know, that it, you know, they didn't want to just say, hey, you know, we we captured uh, a meteor falling to Earth and and really not be able to confirm it. So they've actually been looking for the rock, which has been a little bit difficult because it's in a wooded uh, forest area in Norway. And so they've been looking for the rock and they've been analyzing the the footage. And um, uh, so and, and part of the reason that they came out with it now, now it's people said, oh, this is April Fool's joke because, <laughs> but you know, it came out on April 3rd. So they did wait till after April First, <laughs> and but the reason that they came out now is because this this time of year is the best time to look for uh, a meteorite on the ground in Norway because the vegetation is die has died back, you know, for the winter. The snow is melted off, and now you should be able to see it. Um, you know, something that fell two years ago. If if it's in, you know, there's marshes and rivers and everything there, so who knows where it is? But from the from the footage, they've been able to pinpoint. Pretty closely, uh, where you know where it possibly could have fallen. But they've oh, had it for two, two years, so they've probably just we can't find it. We're going to open it up to everybody now. Right. Yes. So yeah. So they like, they kind of wanted to put it out there. So he's had you know some volunteers, his family and his friend, the skydiver's family and friend, and they've had volunteers out looking for it. So yeah, they want to open it up, and I'm sure they're going to get a lot of people, because you know I'm sure a rock like this would be one really valuable and really cool if they did verify that it was actually a meteorite. So I wonder if uh, Jeffrey Nodkin of the Meteorite Men has looked at that video yet. He, uh, that's what I, I want to hear. I asked him on Twitter. I'm going to see if he replied. Yeah. To I think I think I saw your. I think the first I heard of this story yeah. was your tweet, Jeffrey. That's that's who I would ask. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. I, I haven't looked at it yet. I'd like to take a look at it. I, I haven't had a chance to. I saw you working on the article, but I hadn't read it yet. Yeah. No. I feel like if anyone's going to find it. Yeah. I mean, talk about a needle in a haystack. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's in a pile completely. of rocks. Yeah, completely. So yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting story. I mean, if if they are able to confirm it, it'll be really really cool. But uh, or would it just know, be really embarrassing for the skydiver who packed his chute improperly and there was a rock in it? Like <laughs> that's the other thing I've seen. Yeah, yeah. That that seems the like shoot. the most likely to me. But it that's seems to come. I mean, it's it's. Downer. It's I haven't seen the video, so moving pretty quickly, and it's sure. it's just the trajectory. I don't know. So and that's the and I assume it's the right it's the right height in the atmosphere where it would not be making right. fireball. Right, exactly. <laughs> it, it would be it would be in its dark flight mode dark at flight. that point in the at the in the atmosphere. That we, we had a guy last year that claimed he had found a piece of mirror, and he claimed that NASA had confirmed it. And I contacted NASA, and they're kind of like. 
no, we don't. We don't even verify those sorts of things. So it's uh, it, it was it was that one was kind of suspicious from the get go. But yeah. Well, check out the video. Uh, I put a link to Nancy's article on the Hangout page. Uh, so check it out for yourself. Um, yeah. And uh, keep you know keep your eyes peeled next time you're skydiving. Just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Not like there's much you could do. Let's face it. Oh, man. All right. So, David, we have some cool observing highlights coming up this month, the Global Astronomy yeah, this, Month. Yes, for Global Astronomy Month, it actually is very fortuitous because there are two of the biggest events of the year are happening, and North American observers are going to get to see both of them. Uh, the first one coming up is the opposition to Mars. Uh, coming up on April 8th, Mars is at, not it's quite its closest, it gets close, a tiny bit closer about the Earth-Moon distance a week later, but opposition is where it's rising opposite as the sun is setting, so it's, it's uh, we're right in that one month season when it's the best time to observe Mars, because it's visually the largest in the telescope. It's not quite as good an opposition as we had in 2003, when everybody remembers when it was the closest in 50,000, 100,000, pick your number of years yep. close. It was, it was, it appeared about 25 arc seconds across back then, which is as large as it could get. This year, it's only going to appear 15 arc seconds, which is pretty good. We're actually in a cycle of oppositions that are getting better and better. Opposition comes around about every 26 months. The opposition in 2018, however, is going to be nearly as good within a tenth of an arc second as the one in 2003. So we're, we're coming back around to that again. And you can see, I've been looking at Mars every night, every chance I get. I showed it off at a star party I did last Saturday. It's rare you actually get to show people Mars at a star party. Usually Mars looks like nothing. We mm -hmm. could see the, uh, the northern polar cap is tipped forward right now, so you could see that. It's uh, summertime in the northern hemisphere on Mars. You can see some of the de uh, detail on it. Uh, Sirtis Major is one of the major areas when it rotates around. That's a big uh, dark triangular area on Mars that's usually pretty apparent. What's interesting when you're observing Mars, too, is Mars rotates once every 24 hours in 37 minutes. So when you're looking at it night to night, it only moves a little bit out of place. If you look at it 8 o'clock every night at the same time, you're only seeing maybe about 10, 15 degrees of, of longitude change. So you're, you're gradually seeing it change in that. And you can see it in, the, in one night as you watch it when it goes from low in the east at sunset, then it's right here at midnight or so when you're seeing it right due south and it's transiting. You actually can uh, see some change in the rotation on it. So it's, I expect uh, some amateurs to be doing rotation movies like we had in Jupiter. And you know it, it definitely is a season to get out there and observe Mars. The uh, virtual telescope, Telescope, they're going to be doing a broadcast Tuesday night, and SLU is going to be doing a broadcast Tuesday night on April 8th on Opposition Night. They're going to be broadcasting that. We have a post on Universe Today up on that. And, you know, sometimes things can come up like dust storms or, you know, Mars, Mars is a changing world, so you actually can see those kind of changes to the telescope when you're watching it. The other big thing coming up is the total lunar eclipse on April 15th. This will be the first eclipse of the year, and all of North America gets to see this one. Uh, I will be up watching it in, in the early hours of the morning of April 15th on tax day. And all of, all of uh, North America, South America, what's cool with the lunar eclipse is if you're facing, all you have to be is on that hemisphere of the Earth facing the moon and you see it. It's not like a total solar eclipse where you have to go to outer Mongolia or some desert island in South Pacific to find this narrow track where the, the solar eclipse passes along. So I've seen a lot more lunar eclipses than I've seen. I've never seen a total solar, actually. I've seen an annular. There was an annular in 94 that went over Lake Erie that I managed to see. I'm still trying to see my first total solar eclipse. I just never seem to be in the right place at the right time. Hopefully in 2017 I can change that because there's a total solar eclipse passing over the U.S. then. Either Somewhere that or, it will I, be clear. Somewhere yes. it will be yes. clear. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple before that, too. There's one up in the Arctic next year, and there's another in Southeast Asia in 2016. So if I don't get to those for some reason. But the cool thing is you can see two lunar eclipses this year from North America. This is actually part of what they're calling a tetrad, where there's four, there's a series of four eclipses, two this year, two next year, and North, parts of America are going to get to see all four. We haven't actually had a total lunar eclipse since uh, late 2011 was the last one. I believe, so we're kind of due to see one. There's also the, this uh, rumors and woo going around about the blood moon right now. I haven't quite got my article done debunking this yet. Uh, there, there's a, This is turning out to be the next 2012 Mayan apocalypse, pick your apocalypse kind of... So really? it's, it, it, it's really? having... 
It, yeah, I know. It's it's it ha it's having the propensity to possibly be the, the next like in into the world of the week, as Stephen Colbert would say. Into so the world it's. Of the week. Uh, it, it's uh, and part of the hysteria going around is the fact that it, the the total lunar eclipse uh, this year and next year falls on Passover, which Passover falls on a full moon. So by definition, you have to have a full moon to have an eclipse. It's not really all that extraordinary, but people are kind of taking it and running with it. I mean, I could also point out that next year's final lunar eclipse falls on World Rabies Day, but we're not calling it the Rabies. I'm sorry, lunar Rabies. Day. <laughs> yeah. There's a World Rabies Day. There, there is a there's a day for everything. There's there was a World Rabies Day. Wow. Oh. Do you have to go you get you shots in your butt? You don't watch you don't watch The Office. Your stomach. You don't, you don't remember. No, the... we do in the butt now. Oh really? Oh. It just it just kind of shows that you know you you can basically you can basically pick whatever day an eclipse falls on and there's something that's happening something you know whether it's, yeah so it's uh, pe people are trying to see you know Neil deGrasse Tyson just talked about on Cosmos humans were great at seeing patterns at places where they don't exist so and things like astrology and those kind of things where you're like ah oh, lunar eclipse is happening on Passover that has some kind of significance well it's cool to watch but I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't like charge my credit card up on it or think the world's ending or anything like that. So we but won't, be, if won't be so we won't be seeing that green finger of death like in the Ten Commandments movie that <laughs> came on Passover. If we do but, it's a coincidence. Right. <laughs> Amber doing doing I am not pronouncing it right. Uh, if your name is Amber, you get a lunar eclipse on your birthday. And that's pretty exciting. So, yes, cool. we did get a comment that uh, <laughs> it's her birthday, so I see that's a reason to celebrate. Right. And you know, what, what else is cool about lunar eclipses, real quick, is you can just watch them with the naked eye. I mean, I watch them through the telescope, and I'll, I'll probably be live streaming and doing images of it, mm -hmm. but, you know, you can just go out, and it's one of those events. You don't even need the geeky uh, eclipse glasses or anything like that. You just go out, and you're like, oh, there's the eclipse. You can see it. So, you know, it's, it's really kind of an event for everybody. You just have to make sure you're on the right side of the Earth looking at the moon at that time. It's a bit slow, though. It's not the it's, it's a little more, instantaneous thing of the solar eclipse. Totality for this one is, looking at my chart, one hour and 17 minutes. So that's okay. that's pretty long. So you've yeah. got a good long time. And it's early morning, so so I'll probably be pulling an all-nighter that night to, uh, to take pictures and... And I'll probably be doing a photo roundup on Universe Today because I'm sure we'll be getting flooded with photos on our Flickr page the, the day after. So Right. Yep. And so read all about these uh, things that Dave's talked about on Universe Today because he's written some excellent, excellent uh, articles, guides on how to see the, uh, the eclipse and the opposition. So check them out. So we have uh, Tim Rogers, who's in Brazil, wants to know will it be visible down there? Yes. Uh, actually... Brazil, they're going to see the the eclipse is going to be underway. Totality will be underway at moonset. So you'll be watching at right around sunrise. Get up an hour or two before sunrise, and you should be seeing the the eclipsed moon as it's going down in the west as the sun's coming up in the east. So very cool. So that is a couple good ways to celebrate uh, Global Astronomy Month. I want to remind people that April is Global Astronomy Month. Uh, Astronomers Without Borders has a schedule of events up on their website. Just go to astronomerswithoutborders.org. Um, and so they're doing photo contests, they're doing hangouts. The Global Star Party is Saturday. You should see if there is one happening near you. Um, I don't know if you guys are, are running or attending any Global Star Parties tomorrow night, but I will be, you know, weather permitting, throwing a little star party here in Edwardsville. Um, so yeah. you should check it out. You know, it's ironic. I did star parties the last two Saturdays, and I don't have one scheduled tomorrow night. So I'm, I'm, I'm available. Okay. <laughs> You're, you'll just observe whatever, whatever, whoever's yeah. around. Come show them the telescope. I'm sure I'll be out if it's clear tomorrow night anyway. So. Yes. Yes, yes. That's good. Um, we had a question from earlier from Michael Jobin, and I think he's asking about magnetic fields, um, since we were talking about that with regards to the Jupiter system. Um, does a magnetic field need captive ions to have effective shielding? Oh, that's a tough question. No, that's a question <laughs> that's out of my... Uh, sure. Great. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if Nancy sure. can do yeah, a better um, job there. Nope, nope. That's out of my league, too. Okay, so uh, I mean, I mean to, to generate a magnetic field, you have something with ions, uh, something that's charged and rotating. Right or not, or not necessarily charged, but has ions and is rotating. Like you have the interior of Jupiter is um, primarily liquid metallic hydrogen, so you have this hydrogen that is so compressed it's down to a liquid state, but the um, it's metallic and that the electrons are free to move around. 
that's rotating, creating the magnetic field around Jupiter. Um, I think he's asking more about the question about you know how magnetic shielding. fields behave far from the planet. You know, in terms of sh maybe shielding from the solar wind. Um, uh, I was thinking because we were talking about shielding of the moons itself. Um, because there's charged particles going around in the magnetic field, they tend to slam into things like the moons that are there, um, unless the moon has its own magnetic field, as in the case of Ganymede. Right, or even Europa has an induced magnetic field because it has a liquid on our ocean. It's yeah. kind of weak, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. No, it's a very weak one. Yeah, it may not be enough to protect you. Um, but yeah, yeah, magnetic fields, difficult. <laughs> so if you have a more specific question, put it on the Google Plus uh, Q&A after this, and I will track an answer down for you. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, and uh, we have a question. Does anyone know when the next eclipse will be visible in India? I know hmm. that the uh, the annular solar eclipse at the end of the month will be visible from certain places in Antarctica. <laughs> in Antarctica, yeah, it's a very that's interesting month. That's that that one at the end of the month too is kind of because eclipses always happen in pairs because you get the node of the moon where it's it's what basically the moon's five degree orbit is inclined to our ecliptic and when those nodes meet they, and they happen to be near a newer full moon you have either a you have a total lunar eclipse at full and you have a solar eclipse at new but that one annual eclipse at the end of the month that goes over Antarctica it's interesting because it's what's called a non central eclipse. And it actually just grazes over the top of Antarctica, over the bottom of the Earth. So not many people are probably going to see A few penguins may see it. <laughs> a few penguins are going to see it. As far as India, for a lunar eclipse... They're going to get the tail, or either tail or beginning of the October lunar eclipse, it looks like. Let me, let me look. I can tell you. Give me a moment. Yeah. So um, I just go to the NASA eclipse website whenever yeah, I want to know when too. eclipses are going to be showing up, because they show eclipses all around the world. Um, so look for NASA Eclipse website. Um, Actually, no, they're not getting that India one. Oh, they're not. Uh, they're, they're not getting the October one, rather. But uh, there are two in there are two in in 2015. I wouldn't be surprised if they're probably. Yeah, I would look at the NASA site beyond this. I can't because when I'm doing these hangouts, it would totally crash my computer to go to more websites. <laughs> This is why it's I, great. I have to go to the old paper it. reference to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so eclipse.gsfc.nasa.gov. That's the website I go to um, when I want to know when the eclipses are. So there don't, you go. Don't go during an eclipse because it will crash. I mean, oh, the, that the, makes the sense. Site always, the, the, the site always crashes during the middle oh. of an eclipse. It gets, like, they get too much traffic. Squash. Um... Uh, Morgan, you brought up that we could discuss uh, Cosmos. If we that's it for our, our our news stories, but we have if you wanted to discuss uh, Cosmos either last week's episode or, or next week's coming up. Yeah, well, you know we're four four episodes in now, yeah. and we've covered four very different topics, and we've had sort of four pretty different ways, I think, of you know of looking at these topics. Um, and so for those who didn't maybe see it, this last one was talking about space and time and light and basically how the ideas of special uh, relativity kind of relate them together. Um, and of course we all know that these are not easy topics to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and once again I really enjoyed the, the historical bent. Uh, I thought that the idea of talking about Herschel and sort of our first steps out of optical astronomy and into you know the wider spectrum of light was was a nice thing to talk about because that's been such a revolution in the last 50 years uh, but it's easy to forget that you know for millennia we only could observe well through you know basically optical the light our eyes can see um, on the other hand I didn't really like uh, the end as much where we dove inside of a black hole uh, I thought this was the first time that they'd been really speculative yeah. uh, without really beating us over the head with the fact that it was speculation we're in a black hole. That was <laughs> right, that's what he said. That my my boyfriend Tim watched with me. He is uh, not a scientist. He's a, a communicator, um, and so I, I I was you know trying to get his reactions. I was like, I want to know what a non scientist thinks after he says it was really good until that black hole part. Then he lost me. So I think it's it, by doing something that was cool and speculative, you may they may have lost. Well, it's hard to explain theaters. things that we don't know anything about. Right. He said, he, he said he's like, it was great until the black hole part because I got lost, you know. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's because it was, it was speculative and, you know, I, I likened it to um, 
being about uh, a good, as good of a speculation as the Ren and Stimpy episode where they go to a black hole and find all the missing socks of the universe, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is far more entertaining. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think they had the potential that they could have lost a lot of audience members I, at that point. I, I, I qu- I'd like to quibble a little bit with something about, I know they, they put the bit about Herschel and his son, mm-hmm. about William and John, just because it was a good story. And, you know, I'm, I write fiction too, so it's, you know, you, you never let reality get in the way of a good story. But uh, William Herschel was a slight bit before they actually found the distance by via parallax. It was about a generation after that. They knew the stars were quite a ways away, so I would give that to them. That yes, William Herschel knew they they discovered what was called the aberration of starlight in 1780s, and they knew that the stars had to be more than one parsec away. But they didn't get the actual measurement till it was Bessel, I think it was in when he measured 61 Cygni in the 1830s. Okay. So I know I know it's a tiny bit, but I was I haven't researched this for sure to, to see how well, far off they were, but I think that. That little bit when they were on the beach was a little speculative as far as the history. But yeah, I, I had a, good, a, was a good story. quibble of that same segment, which is I thought they overstated uh, how much Herschel could have thought about the propensity for binary stars uh, in the universe. You know, that, the idea that you know many, if not most, stars uh, out there in the galaxy are binaries is a pretty modern, uh, yeah. pretty <laughs> modern idea. In fact, we've really changed our opinions of it a lot, even since the Kepler Space Telescope launched and found so many binaries. So they, he may have known about some, but the idea that most stars are binaries is a very modern the, idea. The, the one uh, Gamma Leonis that they talked about, uh, which is star LG, but I show people that at star parties, that, that is, I, I'm pretty sure I've read he did study that. And it's one of the few binaries that you could live conceivably live through its orbit and observe where the orbit is like 50 or 70 years or so. So I, I would give them that. I'm pretty sure he did study that one. But as far as knowing the distance and scale, I know he tried to do some of the rough measurements of the size of the Milky Way, but he just didn't have the... He, had, he kind of had some of the rough scale, but they didn't know the distances. Of, they didn't get the first parallaxes to the first stars yet at, at that point. But, you know, that's just me being pedantic, I know. But yeah. well, I like the show. The, I most like of the, the show. Any complaints I've heard about it, it's not about the science. It's been about the history stuff. Yeah. Um, people have had... The, the, I guess the, the people I follow, uh, those are the, that seems to have been the biggest problems. History is much more subjective. We all like different yeah. things but it's, and different it's good, it's good they're doing. They're pulling out some stories like they did with the one on Newton that they weren't the stories you hear over and over and over again. They were There were some new things that I was like, hi, huh, I didn't... I actually sent me to Wikipedia reading, so I was like, I didn't actually know that. So the, for people that are a little more advanced, there's some, some meat to the story too. So it keeps me watching. And the animation's great. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah animation was, style. Right, yeah, I was, when I heard they were going to do animations, I was kind of like, eh, really? But I actually do <laughs> do like them, so. You know what's, what's odd? A friend of mine put his finger on it, too, is you know what it looks like? It looks like the old Bible cartoons they used to do in the 1980s. Which is, <laughs> I always think you know? comic books, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go yeah. with that. Yeah, so has anyone looked ahead what uh, this coming week's episode is going to be on? I have not. I have no, not. I'm seen it. I have a little okay. block in my calendar that says Cosmos. That's all. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I think it's cool they put it up on Hulu too, so us folks that don't have cable can watch it Monday over lunch. So that's when I watch it. I don't have cable. We got an yeah. antenna. I turn. I turn, <laughs> I turn Twitter antenna too. I, I turn Twitter off Sunday night so I don't have to hear everybody tweeting about it, and then I watch Aww. it at lunchtime. <laughs> I've mean, had people complain about spoilers on the West Coast, and I'm like, seriously? <laughs> it's not really a plot. <laughs> no, no, now no, if no. I'm tweeting about Walking Dead, you can get mad at me, but not yeah. Cosmos. So I'm going to continue to live tweet Cosmos with the hashtag Cosmos, so go ahead and meet the hashtag. <laughs> you don't want it to be spoiled for you. Well, I'm usually setting up for the virtual star party Sunday night anyway, so That's it's usually... Like it's, something it's, else drawing my attention. It's after virtual star parties after the the East Coast and Central broadcast. Yeah, it happens during the West Coast broadcast, but oh, yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's already gone off for us East Coasters. So, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, I hope close. to see you guys, those of you who are watching live on Twitter, because uh, I will also be using. Uh, I like because I don't understand most commercials. I uh, I open up CosmoQuest and I map some craters. Oh, it was so cool that you got one of the Apollo sites. I know. Oh, man, I couldn't came believe right it. I saw on that. the Apollo 15 landing site yet last week. I was so cuz I I mean I don't actually map all that often. I work for the project, but I'm doing like, you know, all the other stuff. So when I actually sit down and do the mapping, it's not that often. It's usually when I'm showing somebody. And then 
<laughs> I'm sitting there and I get the Apollo 15 landing site in my browser. Very oh, cool. nice. So you never know what you're gonna come across. Oh, oh so, something we missed speaking of the moon real quick in eclipses. Oh, yeah. um, and I know Ken Kramer's been covering this, but I've been reading about it. Is Laddie is coming to its end? <gasps> oh yes. Oh, I just saw a press release come out of, about that in my email. Um, they're planning to uh, crash Laddie yeah. into the moon, which we knew was happening, but I, it, it's been it's been it's been postponed. So you know. Well, they had said for some time that it, since it's solar powered, that they didn't know if it would survive this upcoming eclipse, which I thought was kind of odd because I'm like, well, it's only going to be in the shadow for a few hours. Oh, I don't think yeah. that would really hurt it, but. I guess they, they thought it was enough that uh, that they said that this April 15th eclipse would probably, because it's seeing a solar eclipse from that point, because mm -hmm. they're looking back at the Earth and the Sun, so Geology. just something interesting. Yes, yeah, so we will, uh, once that impacts, I'm sure we will talk more about that. Right, and there's a contest where you can predict when, when it's going to impact. Is it when and where, or just oh, when? I haven't seen that. Yeah, really? yeah there's a contest, yeah. Awesome. Hit the moon when it fries. All right. I, I just knew there was an eclipse tie into it, so I was kind of I mentioned it briefly in the article, and I was kind of tracking that briefing that Ken said in on yesterday. See what they would say any more about it versus the eclipse. So yeah, poor laddie, but it's done good science. Yes, so, yes, it has. So we will cover that when it impacts. We will cover it after it's due. <laughs> I'm sure. So. All right. Thank you so much for joining, everyone. Would you like to? We'll start over on my left or on the left on the box here. Uh, David, tell us where we can find out more about you and your work. See, I was active today or this week on listestorecanada.com, my own site, Ask for Guys with the Z. I tweet as Ask for Guys with the Z and Universe Today, of course. I've been active there this week as well. I'll be at the virtual star party and Sunday night, and I might have another sci-fi story self-published on Amazon here this weekend. It looks like Ooh. I'll have one wrapped up. So I, that's another thing I, I work on is science fiction writing. Actually, I actually have a better time with, uh, with the journalism thing than I do with sci-fi is a tough field to break into. <laughs> yes. Journalism's easy. <laughs> Sorry, dying. Morgan, tell us more where we can find you and your work. Yeah, well, first off, I'll be taking the rest of your questions this afternoon over at the Google Plus Space community. So if you had a question we didn't have time to answer or a really hard question that we didn't want to answer, uh, I will find you uh, an answer to that question this afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be at Fisk Planetarium for their Astronomy Day, uh, giving talks all, all afternoon about cool stuff in space, so if you're in the, the Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins area, swing on by and come say hi. Uh, you can find me at cosmicchatter.org, um, and we tweet at cosmic underscore chatter. Very cool. Nancy? You can find me at Universe Today, and I tweet uh, at Nancy underscore A. Very cool. And I am Nicole Gallucci, postdoc over at CosmoQuest. Go to CosmoQuest.org. Uh, I occasionally tweet at CosmoQuest X. I'm also a noisy astronomer. And this was your weekly space hangout. So thank you for joining everybody. Hey. Bye. Bye. See ya.